Jesse expounding on all these other topics real quick. Um, Jesse is a Vietnam veteran and he was a member of the Navy SEALs Underwater Demolition Team 12. Jesse was also a professional wrestler and entertainer for 11 years. Uh, he's also a professional actor and currently vested member of the, both the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of Television Radio Announcers. Uh, Mr. Ventura has also uh, participated as a professional radio talk show host, which he still is over the past 11 years, currently with KFN Radio 11.30 a.m. Uh, Jesse was also mayor of Brooklyn Park and was honorary chair of Dean Barclay's 1996 campaign for the U.S. Senate. In addition, Jesse currently serves it on the Nickawish of Minnesota Board of Advisors and is a volunteer football coach at Park High School in, in Champlain, Minnesota. And um, you probably got a red cape underneath your shirt too, Jesse. <laughs> this is just part of it. Um, so I guess without um, any further hesitation or ado, I'm going to announce our tonight speaker, Jesse Ventura. I just dressed this morning. I thought it was appropriate. I got it. Was just work or do hey, click it. There, I'll use it. I'm more comfortable with the mic. <laughs> <laughs> <Where's Gene? laughs> anyway, uh, I'm Jesse Ventura, and I'm not going to go all into my background and all that, but I will tell you this I'm running for governor. And probably the main question you're going to ask me tonight is why am I doing it? And uh, it's interesting to come out and talk to all the different groups, this and that. And I'm, I've learned so much in the last couple of months since I've announced my candidacy. It's been very much eye opening from top to bottom. I mean, the things that I'm learning and doing and talking and going around and talking to different groups and all that. And, and uh, it's terrific uh, working with the Reform Party. I think one of the things I'm most proud of right now is that uh, in my candidacy, we do not have one person getting paid. Now, I don't know if you read the papers and all this, but there are certain candidacies that hire people away from the University of Minnesota and give them, I assume, quite high-paying jobs if you hold a nice position at the U or director of this or that or whatever. And uh, I would assume that something comes after that because why would one leave a job at the U, say, to go on a campaign that could very well end? in November, you know, and, but if you win, then I guess something else has to be promised, doesn't it? I don't know. You tell me, I know all volunteers, so I'm promising nothing but a good time and a few laughs, and, although we do take it very serious, but I always tell them, I think my campaign people will attest to it after every function we do. I generally always ask them, are you having fun? Are you smiling? And are we still having fun? Because I said, the moment we're not having fun anymore, I'll announce I'm dropping from the race, because that's what our candidacy is all about. And uh, I'm not going to go heavy into my background and all that stuff here unless you want me to. I'll leave that up to you and I'll open up for questions if you want to know all that stuff. But uh, it's been interesting, because every group you go in front of and if other candidates are there, it becomes kind of a contest to see who can try to convince the group that, yes, I'm really an expert. That's why I'm running for governor, and that's why I'm talking to you tonight, because I know what you do, and I'm an expert. And that's hardly that at all. You know, I'm here talking to you tonight, I assume. And I had a question for you all. Now, are you in this fire prevention because you dislike fires or that you like them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I only ask that because I remember the movie Jaws when the part of Roy Scheider, the sheriff member, he couldn't swim, and yet he chose to live on that island. And remember when he said, well, it's only an island depending on where you're looking at it. You know, and, and I kind of thought of you fire guys here tonight, and I thought, I realize you're fire prevention, but are some of you get intrigued in this because really deep down, you know, you're infatuated with fire, and, and, you know, and preventing it becomes a natural, you know, because you know what it can do and you've studied it or whatever, you know, so I, I kind of thought of that tonight when I came here too, but it's been, it's been fun and interesting, these things, going to them in different debates and stuff that are happening. Uh, 
I learned very quickly that the, all the other candidates, it dawned on me, uh, they came up with a lot of the same answers. The only thing they did night in and night out so far is they've simply changed the name of who they're talking to. Like one particular night, if it's the nurses, then I, I'm, I know everything and I'm aware of all the nurse problems and they give all these answers and then a couple days later it's the farmers and I noticed the answers were the same. It was simply that they changed farmer and nurse. <laughs> and the other thing that I'm finding out is something that's very disturbing to me. I grew up, I was born in 1951, and we had a president that, unfortunately for me, I think died in 1963. And, but he had a saying that asked a simple question, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I'm becoming alarmed over the fact that, did that die with Jack Kennedy? Did it die in 63, in Daly Plaza, Dallas? Because everywhere I'm going, in front of all these groups, every group asks the same question, what is government going to do for me? Is that where we're at? How did government become so powerful to us that either we can't function without it or they won't let us? I haven't figured that one out yet. And uh, I, I was going to come here tonight, you know, my people are very good. And again, when I get back to becoming an expert, they help to make me an expert before I come to these. They're doing their job. Fans, machines, <laughs> things like that. And I reviewed and got all set to come here tonight, but you know what? Then I thought, nah, this is my campaign, and I'm going to win or lose it my way, regardless. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the question I'm getting back to is, is I'm having a real problem with taxes and the size and scope of government. And what I'm going to come here and tell you all tonight is maybe just a story, and then I'll open it up to you, and it's going to answer to you why I'm running for governor. My wife and I, when we left Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, her dream was to own a little farm and to breed horses and do all of that in agriculture. And we found what we thought was our dream home that we created into this great farm. And We've had it four years now, but unfortunately for her, I think we're going to have to give it up because of taxes. The uh, state is sitting on four billion of our dollars, by what I've been told, of excess money. And yet my property taxes have gone up $460 a year average for the last four years in a row. And I made a deal with my wife when we did this, that she had to break even for it to become a reality. And now, because of taxation, she is caught because she can't break even. Because we're only 32 acres. And so, if she grows, they're going to tax us more because they've done it already. <coughs> because when you grow, they take more. And so she can't grow, and yet she can't make enough now because of taxes. <coughs> to meet what she needs to do. So there's a lot of critical issues happening in the Twin Cities. One is urban sprawl. And I run into these questions, what are you going to do about urban sprawl? What can I do when you have city governments that because you're agricultural and expansion and sprawl is coming, they continue to jack your prices up on your land to the point as a farming operation you can't make it. It can't be done. It has to be subsidized by my income, going out and working another job, or whatever. She can't make it. Because Maple Grove has raised our taxes almost closing in on $2,000 in four years. Yet the state has $4 billion of excess money. Do I, I think you all look intelligent. Do I need to say more on why I'm running for governor? I think the issue is integrity and taxes. I think that's what it's all about. And I'll say this to you. Don't let them fool you that our bull economy is the result of politicians. Our bull economy is the result of private sector, the stock market, you people, people that work and invest in the private sector. The 
thing that disturbs me about all the candidates for governor is they view becoming governor as becoming the CEO of a corporation. Now, every CEO, what do they want to do? They want to leave a legacy, right? They want that corporation, while well, the time of their CEO, to grow and prosper. The most they can do, and they're doing their job as a CEO then, right? Well, I believe that's what these governor candidates view government as. Their job is to go there and make it grow, make it flourish, and make it grow beyond belief. So that when they leave, they've left a legacy of larger, more expansive, more all, whatever you want, government. Well, I don't have that attitude. My, my desire for my four years as governor, my first term, I'll think about a second term. Remember, I only did one in Brooklyn Park because the job was done. It was time for me to move on and go back into my private sector job. We'll get to career politicians. But uh, my, I, my idea for government is this. I'm not going to sit out here and say I'm going to cut government. I'm not going to sit out here and say there's going to be tax cuts, there's going to be this, there's going to be that. My idea is I just want to try a four-year experiment of holding the government right where it's at for four years. I want the government not to grow one penny for four years. And I will veto any raising of taxes that do otherwise. Because with the, the abundance of money they've had over there, they certainly don't need to grow. Did you know right now they've raised your taxes? Did you know that? Anybody here know it? With all this surplus, they have raised your taxes. Do you know where? No, obviously no one did. Well, on your telephone. They've just passed a thing over there where apparently telephones are now a necessity of life. And again, in the old equality thing of all of us being equal, well, if you have a cell phone, the poor person needs a cell phone. So your taxes now on every one of your phones is now going to go to help pay a phone bill of someone who can't afford to have that phone, apparently. Now imagine what this program is going to be like. Imagine the drug dealer who doesn't make any money, really, because he doesn't declare it. So therefore, he now qualifies to be helped out on his phone payment. And who's going to do that? Anyone here like to answer? Let's all at once. Me. <laughs> How's that? But, uh, and that's it. Right now, they have raised your taxes with all of this money that they're divvying up. And as you sit here, the longer they're in session, the more your money is disappearing. Because this is not a budget session this year. So what they're doing over there right now is simply carving up the extra money. That's what this whole session's about. Well, I'm for giving it back. Mine is simple. You put it in, it belongs to you. Now I'm gonna tell you a quick story. When I became mayor of Brooklyn Park, I hadn't been mayor for two weeks. And I didn't know what, you know, hey, I won. Holy, now I gotta do it. You know, it's one thing to run for the office, that's fun. Then all of a sudden when you win, uh oh. <laughs> You don't always have, you're not always ready for it. Because no one knows, only you know when you vote who's going to win. Well, I go in the Brooklyn Park, we, we have, you know, the mayor is a weak mayor, part-time. We have a city manager, highly trained, 100 grand a year. He's there to run the city. He says, Mr. Mayor, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, next year's budget, we're going to be 340,000 short. Wow, 340 grand, I mean, to me, that's, that's a fair amount of money. You know, I could have some fun with that. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I didn't, I'm the mayor, I didn't, I don't know, I'm really elected. He's a pro. I said, what do you recommend that we do? Well, my professional recommendation is we implement a stormwater utility tax. I said, okay, well, I said, what's that? Well, what that is, anyone know here? Just raise a hand if you know, think you do. Well, what it is that, in essence, is they're going to institute a tax to tax you for the water that runs down the drains 
that you paid the bill. Because you got assessed when they put those in. You know, curb and gutter and storm sewers, they assessed you for that. But now they're going to come back and tax you for the water that goes down these drains. Okay? Well, we're 340 short. In the city, you uh, have to have a balanced budget by law. You're not like the feds. You can't just print it up and keep going. You know, you, you got a dollar for dollar. It's got to, by law, at the end of every year. So what happens now in the system? What do we do? I said, ask the city manager. Well, we, we're, we're going to, what you do, sir, is you form a citizen's task force, which the mayor does, and then they go out and they determine at what rate to implement this tax. Now, what does this accomplish? A couple of things. It accomplishes that you, uh, you'll find out at what rate you're going to be taxed, right? It also accomplishes something else. It makes you as John Q. Citizen go, well, this tax must be okay. Because the Citizens Task Force decided it. And they're citizens like you and I. They're not these elected goons. They're not these politicians. This is citizens decided this. So as mayor, I name it, right? Well, I'll speed the story up a little. My neighbor down the street, Floyd Anderson, an old retired school teacher, chaired my campaign for mayor. Retired, smart man, brilliant, got a lot of time on his hands when you're a retired school teacher. Said, Floyd, you want to sh go on this committee? Because I name him. I said, sure, I'll do it. So I put him on with all the other people that was gonna, that they recommended who came forward and all this. And through nothing of me, they voted Floyd to the chair of the committee. A couple weeks went by and Floyd called me at home and says, Mr. Mayor, he said, I think the city's got a lot more money than they're letting on. I said, well, Floyd, I said, by resolution of council, go up and find out. I said, shoot, you're the chair of this committee. By resolution of the council, this deals with city finances. We're going to raise taxes. I think you have a right to go up there and know what kind of figures you're dealing with. So Floyd goes up. Now, I don't know, any of you people, city workers? Now, city workers are great workers. Don't get me wrong. They do their jobs well, too well sometimes, because there's an old thing I learned in the military, a term called need to know. If you don't have a need to know, no one's going to offer nothing, right? Well, that's how city workers work. If you ask the question, they'll give you the answer, but they're not going to expound on it. They're not going to tell you anything more that might be more educational to you unless you ask them. Well, fortunately, Floyd asked all the right questions, apparently. He calls me in a couple weeks. He says, Mr. Mayor, are you sitting down? I said, do I really need to be Floyd? He said, I don't know. I said, I, I'm an ex-seal Floyd. I, I'll take it standing up. What do you got? He said, you know how much money the city's got? Remember they were 340,000 short? <coughs> Floyd says the city's got 63 million. I went, 63 million? What are you talking about? He said, investments, funds. Oh, they've got, they have $63 million. Now, I couldn't get my hands on all of it. I think like 33 of it was tied up. You know, you know how that is. You invest in early withdrawal, you get penalized. Well, you know, the city can't get penalized. You know, they got some investments going here. Smart, we're not going to put, but about 30 million was liquidable assets. So. I'm going to tell you a little I fibbed when I went to the council meeting that night. I pretended I didn't know how much money the city had, so when Floyd came forward with his report, I had installed to where the council meetings went out on cable TV. That's the first thing I did when I got in as mayor. I wanted the people to know what was going on because that hadn't been done before in Brooklyn Park. So when Floyd said the city had 63 million, I feigned surprise and said, how much? 63 million? Because I wanted everyone at home to hear this. Well, to make the long story short, it wasn't implemented, but Floyd got chewed out by some of the good old boys. You know what for? He got chewed out because it was not their job to go out and determine whether to implement the tax. It was their job to only go out and determine at what level to implement it, not whether it should or shouldn't be. Just at what level, and so he didn't do his job. Well, I'm happy to say that tax to this day, to my knowledge, has never come into Brooklyn Park again. It's never reared its ugly head again. But here's an example of government 
again, raising your taxes while they're sitting on tons of money. And I don't get it. I don't get it. And that's why I'm running for governor. Because I want to go over there and find out. I think we're so highly taxed in the state and overtaxed. I think something, all these problems we have, when you strip everything away, it comes back to overtaxation. You hear government talk about they need daycare, they need this, they need that. Why do they need it? They need it because today, if you're a two-person adult family with kids, one of you has to work for the government to pay them. Now, I stand for a lot of things. The other thing I stand for, I want a revamping of our entire tax system. I support a national sales tax. And I, for the life of me, have yet to learn why it is, maybe one of you can answer this, why does the government get your money first? And where in our Constitution, when our country was formed, was it determined that the government would get your pay first? Because they do, don't they? How many get a paycheck tomorrow? It's Friday. Nobody, I do. <laughs> Nobody. When does somebody get a paycheck? Next Friday. Yeah. Next Friday. Next Friday. Okay. Friday. All right. Next Friday, you get your paycheck, right? Who got it first? The government. He's deducted his end. You're getting what he wants you to have. Now, I think something's inherently wrong with that and what the national sales tax does that gives you all the money. And then you decide what you're going to be taxed on by what you buy. And so if you want to live in a fish house and have piles of money, you can have it. No one's going to even tax you for it until you go buy something. Then you'll be taxed. You know what else that does? That gets everybody, doesn't it? That means you got a, a many cottage industries in this country that pay no taxes, like sports gambling. Anybody know a bookie? Anybody know when Saturday comes and the Vikings are playing, who to call if you can know the over-under and all that? Well, those industries are going on though, aren't they? Big time. Anybody buy numbers at work? Come on. <laughs> well, that, that, there you've got a cottage industry <clears throat> Another one people don't want to hear, how about drugs? you got the illegal drug business going on and paying no taxes. They don't contribute nothing because their business is under the table. Their business is, quote, illegal. They're still making tons of money. They're just not helping where we all help, build roads, provide schools. They don't have to do that stuff usually or provide any of that because their business is illegal and they're not taxed. With the national sales tax, they go out to buy a Mercedes, guess what? They're paying like you and I, everybody's equal. So are tourists, so are illegal aliens, so are everybody. And you know what else it does? It puts the government on a direct budget with the economy. Think of this, we're in a bull market now, right? Everyone's feeling good? All right, if the market goes bad and we're all feeling bad, does the government suffer with you? No. They get the money first. They take what they deem, and then if the market's bad and inflation's going wild, what they, they just give it to you. It's up to you to fend from there on. Tough luck on you. Well, by the national sales tax, you reverse all that. You get it first. And that's what this, in essence, what I, I stand for. I stand for this. Who is the most important thing in this great country of ours? Each one of us as individuals or the government? Well, my priority goes to me, and I believe that's what our country was founded on, was us as individuals. Why do you think there was the Boston Tea Party? Because we were being unfairly taxed by England. Remember the famous taxation without representation? You want a couple examples? How many people own their own home? You ever look at where all those taxes go? Well, you got a metropolitan special tax that's administered by the Met Council. They're not elected. Isn't that taxation without representation? They just gave me 50 bucks this year. Their portion of the tax went up $50, and I can't vote for any of them. 
How many own a how many own a lake cabin? Anybody own recreational property? Isn't it amazing? You pay taxes and you can't vote there, can you? So when Roger Moe needs to further his career, what does he do? He can raise taxes on the lake homeowners. Give them a bet, give them, let them foot the bill. Because they can't vote. Therefore, you hold the line on your local citizens and he's a hero. Shoot, they're going to elect him continuously. They don't have to pay any more taxes. Who's paying? Taxation without representation is paying. Uh, how many people are married? Government talks to you about family values, don't they? Tell you what's right, what's wrong, how you should behave. It's kind of a joke after watching the Nationals today with these two parties, isn't it? Family values. <laughs> Why do they penalize you? you? Want another example? If you own that lake cabin, right? If you're married, you get the shaft. Now, if you were living together, not married, one of you could homestead the lake cabin, one of you could homestead the house in town, and you beat the system. Again, you're penalized for being married, even though they tell you to be married. They want you married because they get more money from you if you are. I solved it for them, but they wouldn't listen to me. You know how simple it was? The whole cap and tax issue to make it fair? I told them it's simple. All you have to do is allow each adult one homesteaded property. Each adult. That way marriage don't matter. That way each adult gets to homestead one property. So if you're married, you can then have a lake cabin because one of you can homestead that then because you each will be allowed one property. That's fair. Now it's not fair. Now if you're married, I have a great friends. They're both their second time around and they purposely don't get married because that's their situation. That's how I know it so well. They each homestead Yet, they're, they're as married as I've been for 23 years right now, you know? But I can't do that, my wife and I. So we get the, on the lake property, <laughs> you know? So with that, I think I've talked enough at this point, and, and I'll let you, I'll open it up to any questions. I haven't gone heavily into my background. If you want to know that stuff, I'll answer it. You know, but I just thought we were here to talk politics, and <clears throat> again, I'll say this, I do know that I do understand there's a problem in fire prevention through my reading. And I think it's the same problem we have over at the Capitol right now. Too many cooks spoil the broth. Am I getting close to understanding a little bit? I think that's what I, I deemed is that there's a lot of things that could be a lot better, but because of government bureaucracy and all the stuff and the hurdles they make us all dive through, that the ultimate goal of fire prevention is suffering because, because decisions aren't being made. And rest assured, if I become governor, I'll stir them up. And let, one thing I want to remind you of, though, before I open it up for the questions, is this, and I learned this as mayor, too. A magic wand doesn't come with this. It'd be great if it did, where if I won, they gave me this wand and I could right the wrongs or when I saw an injustice, I could fix it. You gotta remember something. The legislature makes all the laws. Now granted, the governor can influence, he's got power, but the legislature makes all the laws. The governor can only, if they're good laws, sign them, or if they're bad laws, veto them. And again, my promise to you is I'll veto the raising of any taxes. Now, I was told by the press, isn't that painting yourself in a corner like George Bush did? Remember, read my lips, no new taxes, he raised taxes, a lot of people think it cost him the presidency. I said, no, I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Because I said, all I've got to do to keep my promise is veto it. I said, if the tax is that popular and everyone wants it, I said, all they got to do is override me with the two-thirds, and I've done my job, I've kept my promise, and they've kept theirs to you. If the tax is that popular, they've implemented it. Now, anyone here tell me another one? that would be that popular? Is there one out there you enjoy paying? At the end of the month, you go, God, I like paying this one. <laughs> Anyone? See, there, there's my oxymoron, a popular tax. That's why I'm safe. 
I don't think there's a popular enough tax for them to override me with the two-thirds and then have to answer to you. And do the most important thing. Mr. Dawkins of St. Paul hit the nail on the head when he said this. I mean, they, were, they were dueling over the ballpark stuff. And it wasn't about the ballpark, ladies and gentlemen. Don't kid yourself. It wasn't about saving the twins. What all that was about over there was a struggle for power. That's what you have happening over there. The Democrats have the power. They're, this is a controversial vote. They're trying to figure out how do I vote to get reelected to keep the power. Republicans are thinking, how do I vote to get reelected to get the power? Andy Dawkins of St. Paul hit the nail on the head. They had about five different proposals, right? They all lost. Dawkins came out of there and his quote was so right on, so profound. He said, I couldn't support any of these. How would I get reelected? Think about that. That's the essence of what's happening over there. How do I get reelected? It's not about right or wrong decisions for Minnesota. It's how do I further my career? Thank you. We have some. Uh, I'd like to start out with some uh, written submitted questions, Jesse, and then after that. Now you're making me put my glasses. You're having it the whole night without the glasses. Bob, Bob will read them now to I'll you. Get, now I get a written exam. Wait a minute. Get in my drink of water. No, that's Pam's. There, Pam. You can read Jesse the questions. Oh, question number one. What was it like to kiss Verma Thum Thurman? <laughs> Great. No. No, that, that uh, question number one. What is your view of any possible structure changes in the department's administration of public safety and the fire marshal's office and the building code division? And question two, do you see any need to improve training for fire service, additional training facilities, and more instructors? Um, again, I'm an, I don't know. <laughs> You're the people that work in it. Before I make any decision of that nature, I'll consult the people that do the job and work in it, and I'll look at it from an honest viewpoint, and rest assured with me, I don't take any PAC money. Nobody owns me, so whatever decision I would come to, you can rest assured it's going to be mine. Uh, as far as the, uh, at this current time, the administration, by the studying I've done, it seems that you have a problem of someone making decisions. That there seems to be, a, am I right, a bureaucracy problem that nobody will sit down and say, look it, here's the rules we need, this is how we need to implement them, and this is the people that are taking charge. So at one point, I would probably evaluate the two different departments and determine. I don't necessarily know if I want to form a third one, because to me, that just creates bigger government again. Anytime you form something new, you got to pay for it. Nothing comes to government without a price tag. And you've all heard me talk already. I'm not going to allow it to grow. So we would have to, with me keeping my word, we would have to assume one of these two is going to get the power, and at this time, or to make the decision someone but at this time, I wouldn't know at which time until I interviewed, talked, and, and uh, got myself educated enough on the situation to do it. Is, is that an honest, fair answer? You know, I, I, and if, I'm not trying, I, you know, I would can, you know, ask you and the people that work in the industry what needs to happen. That's what I did in Brooklyn Park. I'm not afraid of delegating authority, and I'm not afraid of seeking out the people that work in, in it every day. Just as you you know about fire prevention, what is my knowledge of fire prevention? I know where my thing my fire extinguishers are at home. I know they got expiration dates on them that I check. I know I got my battery stuff there, so I don't know anything more about it than probably John Q. Average citizen that lives every day out there knows. And I'm honest with you about it. When do I have time to do that? I've got a farm to run. I got a radio show to do, and I got a campaign for governor. But once I become governor, then I can focus, because then I only got one job to do if it gets to that point. But that would be my answer to you. Uh, question. Next question. What's it like to work with a dog? 
<laughs> Do you see any of the budget surplus going to communities to support improved fire service and protection? Do I see any of it? I don't know. Ask your legislators. They're the ones carving it up. I've told you what I'd do with it, and again, to answer your question, it would go back to the people, because until it's budgeted by the legislature and it comes on a budget and fits in that budget, any surplus to that budget, in my opinion, has to go back to the taxpayers. It's no different than, imagine this, if NSP overcharged you for four years to the two to four billion dollars, do you think they'd have to give you a direct credit do you think they'd have to reimburse your money? Or would you accept from them, well, we're not going to give it back because we got other things. We'd like to explore other energy sources. And we'd like to do this. And they'll give you plenty of fine excuses or, or plenty of proposals of how they could spend your money. Now, which would you accept? Would you accept NSP overcharging you for $4 billion and then using it to whatever they decided it was best used for? Or would you want a direct credit back or a check back so that you could decide what to do with your money? So there's my answer to the excess budget. It goes back to the people when, when it deals with me. What is your thought on high rise? What is it, retro bill previously vetoed by the governor? The high rise what bill? What is it? Well, what is the high rise retrofit bill? And I'll give you an opinion. <laughs> you knew what it was. Who wrote the question? Who's responsible for the question? What 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 is it? Um what's your view of it? I know, I don't know. And I'm telling you, I, I mean, it seems good on the surface. I mean, that's no, I, certainly, I certainly, but, but as far as my end of it would be, I would need data and study to find out what, you know, what the, uh, how they work, if they indeed work, which ones work the best, which to implement, at what price, how feasible is it to do it. And, we're, and again, remember something always with government, follow the money. But then again, this is safety, so you have to give it priority because anything that's public safety, that's government's job. And that I will stand for. And that I'll allocate money for. We'll take it from some of the other places it shouldn't be. Rest assured, there's plenty of places that government's into today. Public safety is one they need to be in. And I think we all agree on that. So rest assured, fire prevention will get priority, but it will not get the priority of new taxes It'll have to get the priority of the ones that are there or the shifting of the fat, you know, and finding out where the pork stuff is. And rest assured, there's plenty of it. You know, Brooklyn Park, I gave you that for an example. There was a reason. Like the old Navy chiefs used to say, remember this, you'll hear it later. When they talk to you, I teach them. You know, you will hear this later. Rest assured, you will. Well, I gave you that story in Brooklyn Park for a reason. And that's because I believe government's got a lot more money than they let on. And so I would tell you this, anything dealing with public safety, that's in the direct line of government. That's what they're supposed to be doing and would have my full backing. So if they need these in these buildings, absolutely, we find a way to put them in. That's how I view it, and, and I would go on research. And what other way do you put the fire out? Well, currently, it would be done by manual fire suppression. Which it means fire trucks from outside. Which is better? Sprinklers. The fire, Sprinklers. The fire yeah. trucks only can reach so high in right. an office yeah. tower. Right. That's where right. the retrofit must Well, then, I, I, absolutely. By the time the then trucks see, get there, the building's gone. That's a no-brainer. Oh, yeah. See, as I, and who am I asking? The people who know. You're asking me quite now, how fair would it be if I sat out there and asked you about wrestling? <laughs> <laughs> I you might, but then I may surprise you on fires, too. you got to remember, though, that this is alien to me, because being a Navy SEAL, I'm far more prepared to tell you how to set them <laughs> than I am to how to prevent them. And I'm far more prepared to tell you how to bring that building down rather than how to put it up. So you got to remember that, too, on me, that my background comes from the exact opposite. You're there to prevent, 
my background was there to create. <laughs> so, but I mean, I hope you get the drift of what I'll do as governor. I'm not going to come out and give you blanketed statements of yes, no. I'll talk to the people, whatever the thing is, who know? Who work in the industry. I learned enough from my mom. She was a nurse. I didn't question her on the procedure in the operating room. Ever. You know, she worked in it. She lived it day in and day out. I didn't even question my dad on how to throw a cold patch in the streets because he was a city laborer with the street department. But I, you know, he knew a lot more than I knew about it. But I did learn one funny story. He had a friend he worked with, just to show you that even them guys don't know it all. Great story. I think it was 54th Street in Minneapolis. My dad's friend Chester, they're both gone now. They've, they're, they're up filling the patches up, up, up there. But uh, Chester went out with a truck one time full of coal patch right on 54th Street because he saw all these holes out there in the middle of the winter. Filled them all up, right? Springtime came, it turned out it was all holes in the ice. <laughs> and by the time Chester laid all that coal patch out there when all that melted, oh, was there a mess on that street over there. But, uh, again, that's, you'll see, I think you get a glimpse of my operational style. I, uh, you know, I'm, I, I go to the people that understand and know, and then at that point I'll make a decision after I'm educated. And you educated me very quickly on this one. This one's a no-brainer. You know, I think public safety is in the government's core of responsibility. That, that's it for all these. Now let's open them up to the crowd. Enough to have been written. Let's have the oral exam. Right there. What's your opinion of the legislation? We've got two parties over right now that are constantly all parts of politics. Nothing gets done. Well, my, my, I support unicameral completely. Uh, not only will it save us $25 million a year. Now, unicameral for the federal government, absolutely not. And there's a reason. At the federal level, if you went unicameral, certain states would become too powerful. States with larger populations would carry the power. But at a state level, it's a different story. We don't need to worry because we're only one state. Now, I'll, I'll fire it at you this way, why I believe in it. Where in the private sector do you ever see a corporation or company that has two departments duplicate their work? You don't, do you? It would be downsized. Next thing is this. The nasty bit of politics that happens over there is uh, after two bills clear the House and they've all been spoken about, then they go into conference, this committee. That's where, how many saw Predator? Remember when I said the line, it's payback time? <laughs> well, when they get into this committee, a lot of people paid them a lot of money to run for the offices they hold, right? They campaign finance and people pay. Well, that's where the dealing's done. That's not done in front of you. That's not done on the open house floor. That's done in these closed committee doors where the real wheeling and dealing goes on. Unicameral, that's eliminated everything that is argued right out on the floor where all of us and I am a great believer in making the public as knowledgeable as possible about what's going on. Brooklyn Park, first thing I did was install cameras at all the council meetings. I said this, the people are going to know if they can't come down here, they can watch it at home. And I'll tell you, anyone that went to Brooklyn Park, we had some doozies there. I wish I owned the rights because I really think I could syndicate them <laughs> and, and, and make some real money. But. Uh, we had some there where it would be a hot topic, and I, I, you know, I open up. I'm very open on, on any government thing like that. I had people who would come storming in the door at 10 o'clock at night, red-faced, probably ran four stop lights and did 75 miles an hour because they were sitting at home watching. And they got so burned up that they said, by God, I'm going down there. <laughs> oh yeah, and I'll tell you this, 99.9% .9 of the time they were in support of whatever I was supporting. It was fighting the good old boys and the network, you know. But uh, so yes, totally for you, Camel. Uh, I think that it's, you know, we have what, the, we're about the 25th largest state in population, yet we have the fourth, I think, third or fourth largest legislature. Now we that well represented. <clears throat> And I also would take it a step farther. I'd like to go unicameral, and I'd like to go to full-time. You go to full-time, 
then you don't have to worry about special sessions. They're getting paid a full time. Now you get up their salary, but you can do that because you've cut down the size. So you now can make them full time. Then if you need them and the governor calls special session A, you got a full time job here. You're getting paid good money. Come on back. We're not finished. Well, they make a lot of money during these special sessions. There's per deal, there's all sorts of little bennies. It's, a, it's very lucrative for a person to be in special session over here. And guess who pays? When they're in special session, anyone got any idea who foots the bill? Yes. Good. Glad to see a lot of people. I'm glad to see that you know a lot about yourselves. <laughs> I'm glad to see that. But remember, anything they do costs money. That means you're paying. So I fully support you to Camel. I, like I said, I want to bring down the size of some of this government. And I believe in this. Government's job is to pro provide as close as they can to a level playing field. And from that point on, you're on your own. Government's done its job. They've, and they can't make it perfect because we're imperfect. But if they can make as close as they can to a level playing field for all citizens, then at that point, my legacy as governor, I want you to come, uh, I hope that they come back and think of my legacy and they go, you know, when Jesse was governor, it was like the government wasn't around. That's the legacy I want to leave. And they're into my life, like I told you earlier when I got here. They're destroying my wife's dream because they're, they're raising our taxes beyond the scope of what's feasible for the operation that she wants to run. And it's simply because developments coming out and they, they don't, and then yet they tell you we got to stop urban sprawl. Well, how do they do that when they're forcing out the farmers? They force you out. It just becomes a matter of the bottom line, dollar cents, addition and subtraction. And that's what's happening to me out there. So I'll probably be leaving Maple Grove, hopefully to Summit Avenue. You can solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, next question. And here. What percent would you propose a national sales tax? Uh, I would go to the fella I had in California that was on my show on KSTP. This guy was brilliant at it. And I think he said 15 would work. Because I, and then I brought it up to him. I said, well, 15%, I said, what would that do if you, if, you know, the poor guy that wants to buy a car and now the price of the car is going to go up 15%, maybe he can't buy it. And the guy said, well, here's the, the, the answer to that. He said, in reality, you'd get the car 5% cheaper. Because right now, in the price of every automobile, when you go down there after you're done negotiating and you think you've swerved that car salesman and you got the best deal you think you got, right? 20% of the price of that car right now is built-in taxes that you're paying for. That's been studied and documented. So you would actually, on a national sales tax of 15%, you would actually buy the car 5% cheaper than what you're buying it today. Because 20% is already built-in tax. So that I, I would go to the pros, and you'd have to figure it out. You'd have to, you'd have to see what the budget of the, and the economy of the country is and then compare it off to what the budget of the government needs to be. But you put them on direct budget then with the economy. So if the economy goes bad, they get to suffer with. Why not everyone have the fun? You know, why should only us? You know, let the government tighten the old belt down with it too. Next. Taxation for education, school vouchers versus uh, uh, the way it is now I think that I think that the education system certainly can be improved. There's no doubt about it. I think there's some wasteful spending there, but I think it's government's job to provide a K through 12. I really do. I think it's society's job to to offer and provide a public education for everyone who wants the opportunity to go there from K through 12 and get it. Now I'm a I'm a product of public school. All my whole thing was public school. And I don't have nothing against the private school, but my view is simple. It's government's job to offer their educational program. If you so choose not to use it, you're on your own. That's your decision. So that answers the question, no to vouchers. 
because I, I, I believe in their scholarships available. I think that anyone that wants to go to private school today can, if they work at it, and if that's the choice of the family to make that decision. But I think it's government's only job is to simply provide the K through 12. And again, a lot of people ask, no, <coughs> money, money. There is no study that shows a direct correlation of money spent and education received. And your prime example to that is the city of Minneapolis. They spend more per pupil than any school district in the state of Minnesota, and yet their scores are constantly below. So it isn't about how much money you spend, what type of education you get. And yet I went through that Minneapolis school system, and I had a friend who went with me. In the, in the minimum amount of time, he was a, he was a doctor of chemical engineering for Union Carbide in, what, eight years? <coughs> Four years at IT at Minnesota, two years at St. Louis University for his master's, and then two years later he wrote his doctorate. And he did that through the Minneapolis public school system. How? Because he wanted to learn. <coughs> the teachers will teach. What it comes back to, ladies and gentlemen, is parenting. When you hear about kids getting in public school and they can't read or write, in high school? Well, what parent at third grade wouldn't get concerned if he's a good parent, say, why can't little Johnny see Dick run, 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 run? I mean, if you're parenting, you're not, all of a sudden in high school, it just dawns on somebody that this child can't read or write? Well, that's, that's to me, the problem of the, of the parents. The system can only provide it's up to you. My son graduates this year. He's got enough credits right now. He could have graduated in the spring. We wouldn't let him because mom and dad want to shed that tear, you know, and watch this thing, you know. He's got enough, he, you know. But you know what I told him? I said, you got enough to graduate, right? Yeah. I said, get back there and take as much as they'll let you take this last quarter. I said, take every class they'll allow you. I said, why? Because I said, technically, this is the last free education you're going to get. Now, it's not free. We all know that. It's being paid for. But I told him this is the last time you've got to where you're not going to reach into your wallet and have to pay for that education. So I said, get down there and take everything they'll teach you. It's free. And it's there. The kids just have to use it. Now, how do the kids use it? It's the parents who are at fault. If the system fails, it's the parents who are allowing it to fail. If you're a parent that pays attention, you know what I learned about this year? And I'll bet you it's something in this room none of you know either. My seventh grade daughter brought home DNA. Any of you ever study DNA? Do you know what it is? Remember O.J. Simpson? Remember all the weird little, you know, and all these people from with credentials 40 yards long came on there and tried to explain DNA at the trial, you know, how to identify the blood through this. My daughter's getting that in seventh grade at public school. I'm the science guy. The wife says, hey, you're, this is science. I said, I, I don't know anything about this. I have to sit down and learn it with her. So her and I sat at the table, but that's parenting, isn't it? At what point don't you know little Johnny can't read? So you got public education too with your daughter as well? Yes, my daughters and my son and daughter are in the public school system. Absolutely. <laughs> Why not? And, and, I, and let me tell you, I'll give you an example. At the, con the teacher's convention, they asked what I thought was a strange question of us. They said, if you had to choose, would you choose governor or your kids? Not naturally, I mean, took their kids. I mean, what are you going to do? Stand up and say, no, no, I'd better be governor. <laughs> <laughs> but I gave them an example of the choice I made, and I'll give it to you. First, I'll give you this. Throw my kids aside. Put them out of the equation. I'm not going to give up my volunteer coaching this fall to be governor. I've waited 40 years to get to that dome. And we got a team that may make it this year. And I'm not giving them up. I've sweated with these kids. So I'll coach this fall too while I run for governor. Because I'm not giving that up. The other thing is, the example I gave, 
Well, a few years ago, by 1987, 88, I had a budding Hollywood career. I had people out there, agents, publicists, all that, telling me, Jesse, get out here. It's here for you. Arnold Schwarzenegger looked at me one day, Jesse the body. Why are you coming to LA and become one of the boys? It's kind of impressive to hear that from Arnold. <laughs> you know? And I, you know what I said? So I'll give you your example. I said, well, what's school like out here in LA? Because I have kids. They said, don't worry about that. I said, what do you mean don't worry about that? I have to worry about that. I have children. That's the first thing I ask. Well, you send your kids to private school. Don't worry about it. The decision I made was this. It maybe cost me my career. Because out there, out of sight, out of mind, baby, you'll learn that quick in LA, in the, in the, in the, in the movie industry. Well, I made a decision. I said, I'm not raising my kids in a place where you have to send them to private school. I'm not raising my kids there. So I stayed in Minnesota where I could send my kids to public school. Because here you can still do it, I think. And they're safe yet, as long as we keep it that way. But there's an example for you. I should, you know, hindsight, I guess, is 2020. What would you have done? Schwarzenegger said to you, Jesse, when are you coming out to be one of the boys? <laughs> Wife wouldn't like it? <laughs> <laughs> Mine wouldn't either, so don't feel bad. Uh, not any more questions? Go back. Uh, when you were mayor, you mentioned that you said your term, you figured you were done. Mm -hmm. So, what do you feel as uh, a mayor you were most effective at? What was I most effective at as mayor? Bringing about educating the public on what was happening at the local level and getting them involved. I think the thing that I'm most proud of in Brooklyn Park was not winning the election. The thing I'm most proud of is the fact that the election before I ran, this is a city of well over almost 60,000. 2,500 votes were cast. 2,500 in a city of almost 60,000. When I ran, 2,500 went to 20,000. So the voter, increased 10 times, excuse me. I was more proud, almost as proud of that as winning the election. I think what I'm effective at is <coughs> honesty to the people, integrity and trust from the people. They may not always agree with my position, but they know it's an honest position. And therefore, I think they trust me because of that. They won't always, we're, we're, none of us are all gonna agree on everything. Certainly there's things that I believe in that you don't, but you gotta look at the whole picture. I think I'm also, in the situation I'll be dealing with there with the two parties, always remember this, our government was set, at, set up in a three-pronged check and balance system, the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. I'll ask you the question, why do we want our head executive in this three-pronged check and balance, why do we want our head executive to come out of these legislative two parties? That's the proverbial fox in the hen house. I mean, when a bill comes to me, I can sign it or veto it on its merits. When it comes to a Democrat or a Republican, party pressure. Remember, when those guys are standing up there, there's people in the background that you don't see who are really going to be running things. And it's called the Democrat and Republican parties. And if people believe that the, that the Republicans are cutting taxes, the federal government has grown at record proportion the last four years. They're not cutting taxes. Did that answer? I think I'm good. I don't think, I think that I'm good at persuading people to do the right thing. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. I don't know, pop political wise, what, what would they call that? Uh, not compromise, no, not arm twisting, not compromising, but. Uh, no, it, we'd have to come up with something nice. You know, Getting people to exercise their good conscience. Maybe that's it. Getting <laughs> them to exercise their good conscience. Good hammerlock will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Your position on Minnesota being a right to work state as opposed to the union uh, I, I have to. I'm very strong. I'm a union member. And I invested 
So I'm not a Johnny come lately. I've in fact invested in two unions. So I support unions. I support, but there has to be there has to be a check and balance to unions, of course. You know, if the union becomes, they got to work together with management. Because if one overpowers the other, then everyone loses. It doesn't help for the union to become so powerful that the company then fails. Because then everyone's out of a job. But I do believe in the right to collective bargaining, and I believe in the right to strike. But as governor, if public safety strikes, they may get a strike from me about a size 13. Because public safety is a different issue. You know, that you do have the public safety that you are responsible for. So, did that answer your question? Okay. Personally, I'm not a smoker, but with the um, suit right now that Minnesota has with the tobacco industry, uh, to where they're suing the tobacco industry, but yet on the side they're collecting all these millions of dollars in cigarette taxes. How is, I mean, isn't it kind of sending two different messages? Yeah. It, uh, uh, the thing that, now I think tobacco needs to be brought up to bear on what they've done. <coughs> because anybody, I've read a book called The Cigarette Papers by Dr. Stanton Lance. He's the one responsible for all this. He's a doctor out in San Francisco who woke up one morning and somebody put on his front porch all the internal documents of the Brown Williamson Tobacco Company, dating back to World War II, where he and his people then assembled it into this book called The Cigarette Papers, which is in essence, that's what broke down the tobacco barriers. Now, I think the tobacco industry definitely needs to be made accountable somehow. Nowhere else in this country can you put out a product where you don't have to say what's in it? I mean, when you go to the store and buy a Hostess Twinkie, you can pick up that Twinkie and know what they put in it. I think in making the public knowledgeable, tobacco should have to disclose what they put in everything because they're adding five poisons. They put formaldehyde in cigarettes. And you know why they do it? To boost the nicotine. That's the same thing as crack cocaine. You take the cocaine and you add chemicals to boost it and make it more powerful. The hell's the difference? And yet these people are doing it legal. They also play, you know, I read this book, so I'm quite knowledgeable of what they pulled. And I'll get to the suit and the double standard in a moment. But these people have done, do you know when they, they came out with low tar cigarettes and all that? Sounded like they were doing it for your health, didn't they? Do you know what their internal documents state? They found out that every nicotine addict needs to reach this particular level, right? Now, if you smoke a desert rat, a camel straight, you'll get right there, right? One desert rat, you're there for you know, an hour or two. Your nicotine level is where it needs to be as a nicotine addict. They found this out through their testing. But when they came out with these low tar, low whatever cigarettes, well, they found out through their testing that it took five cigarettes to get you to that level. So now they marketed this telling you, making you believe this was a safer cigarette you're going to get, so you can go ahead and smoke it with more of a clear conscience. But what you didn't realize was that you would have to smoke five times as many, and like Jesse always says, follow the money. That means aren't they making five times the profit? Because they've now discovered what you need to support your nicotine addiction. So you have a, some of these, I mean, they're, the premise of their entire case is the fact we all knew, right? We all knew tobacco was dangerous. That's their whole premise to their case. Yet the head CEO of Reynolds Tobacco says he didn't know, and he's making three million a year. Jeffrey Bible, he went up there and took the oath on the stand and said, I don't think nicotine's addictive, and I don't think cigarettes generally kill you or are bad for your health. Yet we're all expected to have known, yet their own CEO didn't. To me, that shows the falseness of their case. How can they say we all do when the head of their own company doesn't know? Or he testifies as such that he doesn't. But getting back to what the state's doing, now here's my problem. 1994, you know how much money the state made off cigarettes here? 3.2 billion. That's since 94. And my property taxes have gone up how much a year? 
since then, $460 for four years straight, roughly. And they've gotten $3.2 billion just in tobacco tax alone in one year. Did they use any of that money for prevention? Did they use any of that money to educate or, or use it for our health? No, it went into the general fund, the old witches brew. Who knows where it went? Your guess is as good as mine when it gets in there. But there's the problem I have. You have the government, and, and here's the real issue of the problem part of it. The government can now, do you think you will see a nickel from this? Now let's say they let's say it ends up they get eight billion dollars for a figure. Do you think anyone in this room is going to see any of that money? We're all nodding no. Well then, isn't government in a way now using the court system in which to tax cigarettes even more? Then they've already collected in '94 three billion dollars off them, and now they're going back and suing in court. They're going to accumulate more money, and the precedence I don't like about this is what? When government needs more money, they can go sue corporations to extract more? That's the problem I see. So did I answer it pretty good? There is no right or wrong to it. I think tobacco needs to be held accountable. I think that it's, it's a wild, I always throw this scenario on. You and I are gonna go into business, okay? We got a product that's gonna make billions, okay? Now we're going to go to the government, we're going to tell them about our product, we're going to make billions, everybody's going to make money. But then we tell them the downside with our new product. The downside is about 15 years from now, 400,000 people a year are going to start dying from the proper use of our product. And it's addictive. So when they start using it, they have to. Do you think the government would give us a blessing today? Do you think they'd say, oh yeah, go market your product, what the heck? So. 400,000 a year start dying 15 years from the hat. Go ahead. What hypocrisy <coughs> between that and the drug war? <laughs> what about what they've done out in California in regards to people not being able to smoke in restaurants? I think uh, that's uh, awful. I, I, I don't smoke. I don't like going around smoke, but I'm certainly not going to offer government to come in and tell someone in private enterprise what they can or can't do with their business. I think it's horrible. I think it's a person's choice. I think if, the, if, if it's market-driven and smoke-free bars can survive, I certainly, if two bars were side-by-side side and one was smoke-free and one they smoked in and they both offered equal whatever it was, I would go into the non-smoking one. But I don't believe in government coming out and telling people you have to have a smoke-free bar. A bar, come on. People drink in there. We'll give people one place to go. Why not the bar? <laughs> you know, why not the bar? I mean, you just, come, why is it, I, how many listen to my radio show? What's my standard thing? If it's fun, the government bans it. That's the policy today. I don't care what it is. If you're having fun, someone's going to ban it. Somebody developed a little camera to watch fish. Ban it. Geez, that thing could, the, the fish finder is 20 times more deadly than this little camera. With the camera, you gotta be dead still and stopped. The fish finder, you can be driving 30 miles an hour on the lake and that baby gonna beep and scream and go crazy when the fish are down below you. But yet, ban the camera. You know, ban it. Someone has fun, ban it. You know, that seems to be what I'm seeing today, ban it. Every time they ban, what are they doing? Oh yeah, it don't affect you. Personal watercraft, you don't own one. Why should they? What it does do is this. Every time they ban something, they're taking away freedom. And that's what our country, in my opinion, was founded upon. Freedom. As long as you don't harm nobody else, I don't care what you do. Don't harm your neighbor. What you want to do in the privacy of your own, uh, great saying, third party, ready for it? I don't want a Democrat in the boardroom, and I don't want a Republican in the bedroom. <laughs> How's that? That's why I'm standing there. <laughs> Any last questions? Where do, you, where do you stand with like welfare reforms with all the people coming up from like Indiana and Illinois and just because we have the... Well, that's tough because you got the courts. They pass laws and the courts say you can't do it. I, I, I guess my view on that, I, I think 
I'm sympathetic to certain people. I think we need a, a welfare system for downtrodden people. But I have a problem when it's abused. And I have a problem. My view of the welfare system is if you're going to restructure it, here's my view. Everybody gets a job. Everybody. I don't care if you're delivering papers. I don't care if you're shining shoes. Everyone gets a job. Now, what you got to do for welfare? Again, I'm an ex-SEAL. There's a thing called KISS. Keep it simple and stupid. If anybody knows those terminologies. All right. What you got to do is determine, make a determination what it takes to survive. Let's say hypothetically a thousand a month for argument purposes. Somebody gets a job and they make 250 a month. Well, then you subsidize them, the remainder. But by God, then they're at least working. And eventually they're going to climb that ladder, aren't they? They're going to move up like you did, like I did. And they're going to start making more and more, but they're working. They're giving. And I think we as a society, I think our biggest thing is we get angry because we think, by God, I go to work every day. I don't want to pay this guy sitting at home watching cable TV, right? Collecting welfare. Well, I think if we all know that they're out there regardless of what they're doing, they're trying. They're doing a job. They're taking responsibility for their lives, and I think it'll enrich them too. Let's think about them. They're in a system now they can't get out of. It's now generational. Why? Because the government has made them dependent upon it. Why? It keeps the, <coughs> excuse me, it keeps the government in business. Remember, this is a vicious circle welfare. It's not just the poor recipients that are profiting. You've got people in government that want that. You've got to get those people to get personal pride, and they do that by getting a job. No matter what it is, if you make them feel good about having that job, and they know pretty soon they're going to say, you know what, I'm going to bring that number down because I'm getting pride. And pretty soon that person's going to be off welfare and working, and doing whatever it is that they've earned. That's how you do it. You don't do it by entrapping them. And, you know, and there's abuses. I had a guy call my radio show one day, said I go to these homes where the kids are no, no, no food in the fridge, the house is awful, right? And yet he's there, in a, he's there putting in all the premium cable channels. You know, the cable TV channels, the premiums, HBO, all this. Excuse me, that's not a necessity to life. Money should not be going to that. You know, hey, there's free TV. You know, you buy a TV, they, there's four, five, nine, eleven. You know, they're there. But see, so there's abuses on both ends. But again, you, you, you have to give them a goal. And right now, the welfare system is a defeated losing system that creates generations now of it. Just like Minnesota <laughs> creates second generation career politicians. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that didn't get it, my three sons, does that help? <laughs> what about corporate welfare? Corporate welfare too. One of the things I, I, it came to me today, one of the things I'm going to attack the city of Maple Grove on, on my, on my taxes, because I was mayor and I wasn't sleeping. My wife is a corporation, and I'm going to go up there and inquire about how many corporations they gave TIF financing to, which gave them tax breaks to create industry within the city of Maple Grove. Jesse didn't go to court for nothing, you know, when I defended myself. I'm a, I'm a kid that learns from the street. I didn't go to Harvard. I grew up in South Minneapolis. But I'm not stupid. You don't have to go to Harvard to be smart. After all, Phyllis Kahn did. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? What's your view of term limits at the state level? Term limits? I, I, I'm a, I agree to term limits across the board. You'll never get them. Because the career politicians aren't going to cut off their nose in spite of their face. They'll, that'll die. But uh, I'll just give you this example. Every time I go out of my house, I have a big, uh, I have a cartoon on my refrigerator. And it's a cartoon of this old, crusty politician standing on a podium like this. And he's shaking his fist to a group of people just like you. And he's going, send me back to Washington so I can fight for term limits. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at that every day I leave my house. 
I totally support term limits. My term limits would be like this. I don't think anyone, no more two-year terms. They're bull. Four-year terms. Because a two-year term, they spend the second year, first year learning, second year they got to spend trying to get reelected. So they can then come back and do something in the third year. <clears throat> you know, so I'm for four-year terms, but I believe we already have term limits on the president of the United States. And I think there's your precedence. I think two four-year terms is the maximum anyone should be allowed to serve. Then they must, in my book, then they must go back to the private sector for a minimum of two years before they would be allowed to seek office again. But at least make it to where they have to spend two years back where I come from, in the private sector. So they can really learn what they're dealing with. Most of these guys are, are out of touch. Are we done? Oh, here comes the part that, I, that I'll tell you very honestly I don't like, and I, I'm glad you reminded me, and you'll find me very uncomfortable with it. I accept no PAC money, because nobody's going to own me. But again, you've got to run a campaign, and this is the hardest thing I do, <coughs> because I was never brought up to go out, and I want you to think about this a minute, and I want you to think if, if Think of your life experiences. Have you ever had a job or sought a job where you had to go out and ask people for money so that you could do that job? Anyone? I haven't either. And that's why I find this so uncomfortable. Because my father always used to say to me, God bless him, and I'll say it just as he quoted it. He used to say to me, you know how you know they're all crooks? And I used to go, how do you know it, Dad? He said, because they pay a hundred grand, or I mean they pay a million dollars for a job that pays a hundred grand a year. And that's always stuck in the back of my mind when my dad used to say that to me when I was a young teenager, about 13, 14. Why do they pay a million dollars for a job that pays a hundred grand a year? I don't have the answer. But now I come to the hard part. I got have money too. You know, I put myself on the line, and I'll tell you this honestly, I don't need to be governor. My life will be just fine. It'll go on. I don't have to go over there. Rest assured, I didn't have to be mayor of Brooklyn Park. I have a type of career where I can move around. I can, you know, I've been an assortment. I'm the Renaissance man. I never hold a job for more than about four years. I mean, I'm not good enough. I don't know. Maybe too good. But, uh, but, so there's a program out there, and this is how I get my money. How many are familiar with the PCR program? Don't feel bad. Well, there's a program out there where you can contribute as an individual $50 or as a couple $100. We can give you a receipt and the paperwork. You can mail it in to the state of Minnesota, and they'll send you a check for the same amount. Not a credit. You get a check then you've contributed to my campaign. It's an effort what the state has done to try to get John Q. Public involved in the system so that hopefully politicians aren't being bought and sold by the big boys who got the money. This is a way John, the average citizen, can contribute to the candidate of his choice. And that's what I'm relying upon. But I, I feel strong enough that, shoot, I used to sell out the St. Paul Civic Center 19,000 people used to come there and yell, Jesse sucks, all in uni unison. <laughs> and I figured they paid money to do that, and they didn't get it returned. You know, they bought tickets and paid for my livelihood. I kind of thought, you know, how hard could it be to get 10,000 Minnesotans to fork over 100 bucks to my campaign, and then they get it back? You know, so what you're doing in essence is you're giving my campaign a loan for about 30 days, interest free. And it costs you a stamp. And so that's what it comes down to. There's my pitch for how I get my money to campaign. I accept no money from PACs. I accept no political action committees, if you, don't know, if you know what they are. I think that initially those were good things. They banded people together in unison of politics. But I think like many things, They've gotten out of control and they're now the problem. Because today it's the buying and selling of a politician. And they buy both. How many saw Roger Moe's contribution list to his defense fund? Did you notice all the Republicans? 
Why? You guys got any idea? Why would Republicans, dominant Republicans, send Roger Moe defense money? I haven't figured it out either. But it tells me, kind of like PAC money, huh? Did you see 60 Minutes when they covered the two conventions? The same people were at both? <laughs> you can buy influence easy when you bought both sides of the street when there's only two parties. Then it really don't matter who wins, right? Well, that's what we've gotten to today, ladies and gentlemen. You don't elect me. Jesse's life will go on, but then don't come back bitching. <laughs> so that's how I make my money, the PCR fund. That anyone that would feel good enough of me in participating, I would appreciate it. The Reform Party would appreciate it. And I think in the long run, the state of Minnesota will appreciate it. Thank you.